that's probably your quickest route to hyper Bitcoinization because if AI is just using it to transact and there's no converting it back to fiat or anything else, it's just becoming part of a system the same way it is in circular economies or whatever else, but with AI on a much bigger scale. I ended up very, very strangely meeting the person who created the financial instrument that collapsed the global economy in 2008. So his name is Lou Ranieri. He invented mortgage-backed securities. For the first time in human history, we have a piece of technology, financial technology, that's more powerful in the hands of an individual than it is in the hands of a government. Having one standard-based protocol money, it's a game changer. Bitcoin and human rights are inextricably linked. Dollar has lost 99% of its purchasing power, which is making people depressed and putting them on, you know, prescription drugs and they're, you know, and the suicide rate is at all-time highs. Instead, it's like, it's immigrants stealing your jobs. It's this. It's easier to play on people's fears when they don't feel secure about their financial future. The Venezuelan Bolivar to the dollar, the legal exchange rate was like 4.5 to 1. And I was probably getting something like 13 to 1 in the black market. Now that number is like 200 quadrillion to 1. It was a former US president making the first public Bitcoin transaction. That's a historical moment. I want Bitcoin to become normalized. And one of the ways to do this is to get bigger people talking about it. So in this regard, I think Trump has done it a service. You said uh, right before we started that you have been really interesting in life before even coming into Bitcoin, which made you understand or appreciate what, what Bitcoin is. I, I really loved it also with Venezuela and all those uh, backgrounds. Maybe just, just start there. Where are you coming from and why did this impact how you think about Bitcoin? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, before getting into Bitcoin, I had different lives almost, um, going way, way back. I was in the music industry that was like from my late teenage years through my mid twenties. Um, but even during those years, I did a lot of traveling throughout, um, what gets now termed the global South. So I studied in Brazil, studied in Mexico. Both of those had to do, uh, were with children's education, um, both of those research trips, um, I had traveled, you know, during my time off in the music industry, I would travel to places like Peru. Um, but then um, when I left the music industry, uh, I was teaching and doing sort of different sorts of, I guess you would say, human rights work. Um, and it brought me at one point to Venezuela, where I lived under the Chavez regime, and I saw currency debasement happen in real time. So just to give some Example of what that looked like. I think while I was living there, the Venezuelan Bolivar to the dollar, the legal exchange rate was like 4.5 to 1. And I was probably getting something like 13 to 1 in the black market. Now that number is like 200 quadrillion to 1. It's not, you know, the money doesn't even, it's, they don't even use their own money anymore. They just use dollars or in some cases, Bitcoin. Um, and before that, I was actually living in rural Ghana, which was a really strange thing as I was transitioning out of the music business and into uh, into what became my teaching and sort of human rights work that I did for about 12 years. Um, I ended up very, very strangely meeting the person who created the financial instrument that collapsed the global economy in 2008. So his name is Lou Ranieri. He invented mortgage-backed securities. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what those are. Yeah, so I was his waiter at a restaurant. I couldn't make this up in a million years if I tried. And it was uh, he's, he apparently was from my hometown and I had moved out of New York City where I live just to I spent a little bit of time with my family on Long Island in my mid twenties was just waiting tables while I figured out what to do next. He and I got to talking. Um, I had told him I had traveled a little bit in Africa, Latin America at that point. No, just Latin America. And he just came one in one day and said, Hey, could you go and work on this trade school for me that I'm helping to fund in a rural part of Ghana? So I learned a lot about, um, living in, you know, what rural Western Africa, what people have access to, what they don't have access to. One of the things we did with that project was bring internet to, uh, to the village, which was about four or five hours from the capital Accra, which was the first time that people there had been able to sort of log on and have decent streaming internet, which was quite a, quite a wild sort of thing to experience with, you know, the first time to see people using the internet like that. It was quite wild. Um, but yeah, after that was Venezuela. I did a little bit of work with the UN in Namibia as well, but learned a lot during these years. And I wasn't into Bitcoin during any of this. This is between like 2010 and 2016 ish. During these years, sort of just saw what systems around the world offered people and what they didn't. And, uh, you know, I was taking physical and mental notes. I was documenting a lot of it on a blog, but um, yeah. 
came stumbled upon Bitcoin. Uh, I think it might have been the first week of 2018 or late 2017. And it was a sort of instant. There was like an instant feeling of like someone described it to me at a bar one night and there was no like, oh, that's a scam. It was just, I mean, like 100%. I know what problems this would solve. I get this idea of of hard money. Like it, it all clicked for me immediately. And I sort of, my whole life sort of changed trajectory from that moment on, I think. Wait, you, you worked for the guy who invented the mortgage-backed securities, which later caused the collapse in yeah. 2008? It had already happened, actually. So I would be I would be waiting on his table at the restaurant and he would be on the TV, like being interviewed by the news or whatever. And he'd be like, yeah, I didn't mean to do this, blah, blah, blah. It was a very surreal thing. It was a very, very weird thing to be a part of it. So that was like I was his waiter. It was like 2008 to 2010 or so, 2011. Yeah. I mean, he he invented the concept, but the, the banks and all the things like they really use it. Like it's it's not entirely his fault, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I would honestly argue. I would recommend to everybody if you want to learn more about that. There's a book called Liars Poker. He's also f featured in the movie they made. I'm forgetting what was it called? The movie that came out off the Michael Lewis book, The Big Short. So he's mentioned in the beginning of The Big Short, but Liar's Poker is really about him. And it was interesting. He's he's a genius. He's maybe the smartest person I've ever met, but he's also a college dropout, photographic memory, just a very, very intelligent human being. Um, and when he was at, at the time, I think the bank was Solomon Brothers. That's where he invented it. Started in the mailroom, worked his way up, created this financial instrument, but what happened was, and I'm not saying this was the right way for things to be done, it's not, but he essentially created the police force that was looking at all the mortgages as they were being securitized, as they were putting being put into this sort of securitized financial asset. And when he got fired, which happened as a result of, I think, the number one at Solomon Brothers just feeling threatened by, you know, he's like, this guy's going to take over. He fired him. And then basically all of those people who were do, doing due diligence on the mortgage back, on the securities, everything, they were all let go of too. So this whole culture of like, okay, we have this financial product, but we're sort of like, I wouldn't say regulating it ourselves, but we're sort of doing our homework to make sure that the product is actually sound and people can have their opinions on whether a product like that should even exist. I have my opinions on it for sure. But um yeah, so when he was let go, that's when he said it, this will fall apart, this will unravel, and it will cause a financial collapse. He, he knew that from the second that he was let go and that nobody was really like, quote unquote, policing this anymore. Wait, this well, I, I saw the big short, I think like two, three times, but it has been a while. There's in the beginning a scene where someone gets fired. Is that the guy? Yeah, so it, it, the quote from that beginning scene, yes, it's in the beginning. I think he gets fired, but he says, um, there's somebody on this planet who has impacted your life more than Michael Jordan, more than the iPod, and most of you don't know his name. His name is Lou Ranieri. That was, that's the guy in the beginning of the movie. I was his waiter, which was really weird. Yeah, uh, that, That's crazy, yeah. I never researched that, that part. Really cool. Um, and was that like how was that time around 2008? And that was probably also a reason why you then instantly got Bitcoin. Like, like yeah, you, would, it clicked instantly. Yeah, you know, it's funny. You just brought this back. I, I got chills when I thought about it. Around that time, I had read a book by Matt Taibbi called Griftopia. So Matt Taibbi is a pretty well-known American journalist. He he still does okay work. I like what he does. Um, he covers a lot of politics now, but this book, Griftopia, really, really dissected the financial crisis and what happened and, and how corrupt everything was and yada, yada, yada. Um it changed my life, this book. And it's even the way he wrote it. It was very irreverent, very sort of like, fuck you sort of thing. And it was like, okay, now I'm reading this thing that has really good information, but it also has this sort of attitude. And so without even knowing it, I didn't start writing about money or finance back then. I sort of was like, there was a part of me that it really resonated deeply with. And I was like, I want to do something like this guy did. The problem was, even as I studied traditional finance, and I even went back and studied it after I found Bitcoin, I did part of my master's in business administration. It puts me to sleep. It's so boring. It, it does nothing for me. Like it just, it just does. It's not interesting to me. And also it's just insanely corrupt. It's like an old boys club. And I just have very little interest in being involved with it. Certain jobs have, you know, where I've been writing, they've asked me to do some like trad fi writing and I literally fall asleep at my desk. I just don't like doing it. It doesn't do anything for me. So 
I mean, unless I'm writing about something related to like corruption, exposing some sort of scandal, but I haven't really been put in many of those situations. Um, but back to your point. Yeah. So I was really, it was a very strange period where I was sort of being prepped for like for Bitcoin. So I'm with this guy, Lou Ranieri. He's the guy that invented this tool that collapses the global economy. Bitcoin is created out of that. I had no idea what it was back then. I then moved to a place in rural Africa where people have very limited resources, very little access to funds, capital, credit, all of this stuff. And then I live in Chavez is Venezuela, where currency is being debased exponentially in real time. So I had this three or four years where I was really exposed to why Bitcoin is necessary without having an understanding of what without even I mean, Bitcoin existed back then. That's the first epoch, 2009 to 2012. And I just wasn't like I'm not I wasn't a radical enough of a person to be into it. I think a lot of the people back then were like, you know, the cypherpunks and like the super hardcore libertarians and narco capitalists. I'm very grateful for them and what they created, but I just wasn't, that was not like the crowd that I was running with back then. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's even like in 2015, 16, uh, it was probably still hard. Like I, the first touch point for me was 2017 and I still fought three years long straight that it's a scam. So like mm. I, it took me till 2020, uh, to figure it out. I mean, not, now I'm, uh, I, I got Bitcoin with like 20, 21 years old. So it was quite early for me, but, yeah, that's great. uh, that's, that, that was still really hard. How do you think Bitcoin will change those power scales in the world? As we already talked a little bit of about like this, this banking things and also with human rights, how, how will Bitcoin change those scales? One of the best ways I ever heard it put, and in some ways it's this simple and in some ways it's not, um, I was, uh, I can't think of her name, Noelle Acheson. She has a daily newsletter called Crypto is Macro Now, and she writes for Coindesk from time to time. And she's just a very lovely human being. But she said, for the first time in human history, we have a piece of technology, financial technology, that's more powerful in the hands of an individual than it is in the hands of a government, which means inherently for, right? It's like when you think about it like that, it's inherently more powerful for an individual to hold Bitcoin than it is for a government. It's not that it might not help a government. I mean, the United States is talking about a, a treasury reserve asset, Bitcoin as a treasury reserve asset, something that they'll save to help pay off their debt. That's great. But I think it's inherently more powerful, especially in a highly inflationary environment, or if you live under an authoritarian regime, to have something like Bitcoin that you can then um, transact with. Not only that, but save you know the value of your, your, your labor and time in. Um, how that all plays out, I don't know. I, I think some people... I don't know, because Trump is on board or BlackRock is on board. I think some people sort of think we won. I'm not in that camp. I, I do what I do. It's very mission based, uh, very similar to when I did human rights work or taught or I was training to be a social worker at one point. It's very mission driven what I do. I want to defend Bitcoin. I want to make sure that and I also want to normalize it. I want it to be normal for people to use something like this and for people to have the right to hold on to a money or an asset or a, to be a part of a network that essentially serves as something of a financial lifeboat. The problem there is that we know that the powers that be around the world, not just authoritarian regimes, but the powers that be around the world, they're not going to let that become the new norm, I don't think, anytime soon. Um, I know people here in the United States. I mean, I, I just met with Trump last week. I was the person, I don't know if you saw the news with him at PubKey. I was the person that interviewed him about Bitcoin at the bar. And it was... and. And I, he's he's a character, but he's there are still people, even though he's going to drain the swamp and blah, blah, blah. There are still entrenched interests. Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan, people who are not going to let this sort of stuff happen, at least until until they're positioned well enough with the asset, until they're holding enough of it or until they're ready for the paradigm to change. Um, and then the other side of this is that, you know. You're in Austria. I'm in the United States. We have pretty decent legal systems. Um, I don't know all the ins and outs of the Austrian legal system, but I know it might be better than maybe, um, uh, let's just say some other countries around the world that maybe are, they just don't have as developed of a legal system. You know, I think that the legal system, the fact that here Bitcoin is free speech in the United States, you know, these things are really, really important precedents because at the very least, it provides some legal protection for people to use this, whereas in other countries that might not be the way it's seen or the way it's classified. So I think that around the world, there's still going to be a lot of work to do. 
Um, I think what we have to do is just appeal to people in power who get it. And I know that that's like, you know, I'm a statist cuck or whatever, because I say this sort of stuff. I, I'm, I just believe in civil society. I learned a lot from activists like Anna Chekovic and uh, Ludmila Kozlovska and uh, Bota Jarmadine at the Open Dialogue Foundation. You know, I learned a lot that civil society is super important. We have to engage with the people in power. I'm not saying that government officials aren't corrupt and they're difficult to deal with and the system isn't corrupt. It is, no question. Um, but the opposite side of that, I lived under an authoritarian regime. I lived under Chavez. I don't want to live under that. I don't want to create a scenario where that could become the case in the United States or elsewhere. So it's sort of like we have to talk to people. And I think there are decent people out there. You know, there are decent people in government. It's not a monolith. It's not just this big evil thing that sort of crushes our lives. You know, there's it's people. Um, so to get back to your to your question, though, I think it will have an, an incredible impact on human rights. I think it's super necessary for human rights, the freedom to transact. I would say you could argue that it's more important than the freedom of speech because the freedom of speech without the freedom to transact, it doesn't, you know, if you don't have any money, you're, you can say whatever you want, but obviously you can only survive for so long in such a situation. So yeah, this is the case, but you know, I'm just hoping that it's going to take, I think, a lot of people around the world and governments around the world who stand up and say, you know, this should be something that's normalized. People should freely transact with Bitcoin. Um, and I know this might be unpopular in some ways. Like, I, I don't think I think in some ways I'm very, very grateful to what Naib Bukele has done, how he sort of normalized it. There's been other sorts of human rights issues with him that, you know, that get me a little bit worried. Um, generally speaking, you know, I've spoken with the people that work with him. I'm happy for the people of El Salvador that they feel safer and all of this stuff. And, and I think that's a huge breakthrough. You just sort of, you know, as power consolidates, you just have to be wary of like what happens. But yeah, to your, to your point, I think Bitcoin and human rights are inextricably linked. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, El Salvador is fascinating for, for me because I don't know a lot about politics, uh, in El Salvador, um, but I am, I empathize with his situation because he basically ran a country which had a massive problems with murdering and gangs. So, uh, sometimes I think radical situations, uh, may be justifying as I have no clue about the politics there, so I cannot even really say something about that, but maybe justify a, a radical uh, reaction to that. Yep. Um, but yeah, one thing that, that you said, I, I think was really interesting with freedom to transact and free is more important than freedom of speech. I always thought in my head, freedom to transact is freedom of speech for me mm. as transaction is just a form of communication for me. But yeah, that's just like uh, how I look at it. It's, it's, it's really interesting how when, when, when you talk about freedom of speech, you, you cannot have freedom of speech if you are not allowed to transact <laughs> in, in, in your way. There. Like that's, that's, I think that's just not, not possible. Really cool. Yep. Um, would you also say that Bitcoin is just the best tool for, for human rights in, in general, or is that too far? Um, I don't think about, I try not to think about this stuff in terms of black and white or sort of like, um, what's the word, like classifying it as the best or whatever. I think about it just in terms of that it is a tool and it's a very powerful one at that. So I think it's it's one of many tools in an arsenal. Um, I don't think, I, I reject, not reject, it sounds too strong, but I think some of like the catchphrases in Bitcoin, like fix the money, fix the world and stuff like that, they're a little oversimplified while I, while I, while I do believe that fixing the money would fix a lot of problems, I even, I almost, I'll put it this way. I almost reject the term fix the world. It just seems very sort of paternalistic. Like we're going to fix this or blah, blah, blah. I like terms like empowerment. I like terms like giving people more options or an alternative financial system or, you know, a censorship resistant way to do things. I'll give a shout out. I think the book resistance money, uh, written by the, the three philosophers, I think it's, uh, Andrew Bradley and uh, Craig Warmke. Yeah. So the, the, the book resistance money, I think does a really good job of laying out like, look, we can talk about Bitcoin theoretically. Is it the best? This, is it that, is it going to bring back like a new, I don't know, is it going to bring back Renaissance architecture or something like that? Like we don't really know, but we know what it is right now. It's a system that people can access if they have an internet connection, they can use permissionlessly. And I think inherently this makes it an extremely important tool for human rights. Absolutely. I love that point. Um, 
this podcast probably comes out before the Bitcoin Amsterdam uh, conference, uh, which I will also be speaking on on a panel. And today I had a discussion with one of the speakers um, and we discussed like what kind of uh, inner topics we should discuss on the panel. And one thing that might also be really interesting is what, like when we look about the f vision for Bitcoin in 2050, what, which is the topic of the panel, um, what Bitcoin doesn't solve, like what, what, what problems will Bitcoin not tackle? Uh, so like, uh, I will just give it to you. Like, what, what do you think when, even if we are in a hyper Bitcoinized world, we maybe even got rid of complete fear. Like we are actually in this dream dystopian Bitcoin world. Yeah. What, what problems are still there that we might have today? Um, you know, there were plenty of things that happened during period there were plenty of bad things that happened during periods where the world had hard money there was slave trade there were still you know bad things going on and as you asked that question one of the things that came to mind at the bitcoin nashville conference we were at the live desk with uh with my boss pete rizzo and uh, femi longue from the human rights foundation i think then he was with b trust builders yeah he he joined us and we were talking about the u.s stockpiling bitcoin treasury reserve asset all of this stuff and Femi said something like, I hope that doesn't happen because then you'll have all the Bitcoin, which means you'll have more of the purchasing power and you could sort of still dictate terms for places in Africa, Latin America, all of this stuff. So I think hyper Bitcoin's coinized world, you know, I think it all sort of it depends how much the everyday person adopts it. It depends. You know, I mean, if it's uh, huge institutions that sort of hoover it all up and then have us sort of acting like puppets because they have all the purchasing power, it's not a great thing. Um, I don't think that's the way it will go, but I think the other, the deeper thing is that even if, you know, we have to be people with each other, you know, we see on Twitter being kind can be difficult, right? <laughs> being human and stuff can be, you know, can be challenging. We're still going to be confronted with treating each other well. I think issues of, you know, we're, so I'll put it this way too. Like we are hardwired to have in-group and out-group bias, which means, you know, you're a different gender than me. You don't look like me. You're a different race from me. Therefore, danger, right? That's biological. So we still have to put in that effort to, there's a, there's a really great book. I'm sorry about the tangent, but I think it's important. There's a book called uh, Bowling Alone. It was written by an anthropologist at Harvard. I'm forgetting his name, but the point to the book, he set out to write a book on diversity and how it's good. And what he learned in the book is that diversity is actually not good when people don't have something else in common. But it's good once people have something else in common, which is also why I think Bitcoin is a really powerful tool. But what he basically said is like, look, if you have like a diverse neighborhood in the United States and a lot of those people either play on the same softball team or go to the same church and then they see each other as like a teammate or someone that believes in the same religion or that does the same thing, they tend to have deeper bonds despite their differences, whatever racial differences or ethnicity differences. Um, but when you don't really have that, you know, there's still sort of like, you're over here, I'm over here. I don't totally trust you. It's just part of human nature. And I just think, I don't, I think in some ways, you know, Bitcoin could be this amazing force. If we, if we look at each other, people that don't look like us in the Bitcoin space as Bitcoiners, then it could be a really powerful term, right? We're, we're, we're naturally sort of allied with now people in Africa who are fighting for this in Latin America and Southeast Asia. I mean, you and I are white guys from the West, you know what I mean? But we're, we're part of a movement that includes people from all over the world, all genders, super diverse. Um, but at the same time, when I have certain conversations with people who don't look like me or look like you, they do talk about how it's harder to get their voice present in conversations. Yesterday, I taught a class and I'll give a shout out to uh, Bitcoin Dada. I don't know if you've heard of it, but if you have a chance, you should have Lorraine Marcel on. She's uh, the head of a program for African women that teaches them about Bitcoin, but also teaches them skills to then get involved in the Bitcoin industry. So I taught a writing class there yesterday. And, and with what Lorraine had to do, she would go to these Bitcoin meetups in Kenya and it was filled with a lot of guys. And she said it was like rough. You know, they were very sort of aggressive, like, you know, defensive about Bitcoin, which I get. It's like defending the tribe sort of thing. But one of her biggest jobs has been making space for African women to have a voice in this space. You know, like we we still have to do that for each other. Bitcoin does not automatically do that for people. You know, we still sort of have to be people, deal with our biases, deal with some of, you know, the issues that have have challenged humanity forever. 
At the same time, I think in a world where money retains value, people will be a little bit less stressed, meaning like you work your job, you have your money, you have less of a reason to be angry and say, oh, it's these immigrants stealing my jobs. It's this doing this. It may alleviate certain other things where I think like in the United States, something that, you know, Trump plays on is sort of like, it's like, a, you know, it's, it, there's never a discussion of like the dollar has lost 99% of its purchasing power, which is making people depressed and putting them on, you know, prescription drugs. And they're, you know, and the suicide rate is at all time highs. Instead, it's like it's immigrants stealing your jobs. It's this, it's easier to play on people's fears when they don't feel secure about their financial future. So I think making people feel a bit more secure about their financial future, having an asset that holds value over time, I think that might help to alleviate some problems, or at least I hope it does. Yeah. I hope so too. And, and it gives us the um, importance of having uh, sound money and having something that we can rely on, having a foundation there. Which yes. also, this is a question that I ask me a lot. Like, we are now in this early Bitcoin community. Um, there are those big Bitcoin conferences, but uh, there are not so many bi people that actually understand Bitcoin. I don't know how what, what the number is, like if it's 100,000 or 500,000 that actually understand and uh, have a deep understanding for Bitcoin in the whole world. Uh, very yep. hard to, to say, but um, we are in a very early community. And sometimes I think like the early community gives an insight in what uh, the world might look like, but maybe also not because we're just in a very early community where people actually critical think they come early to something they are more brave than maybe others or uh, are, are more likely to overstep their own ego to yeah. actually look deeper onto something so like that i think that's a we, we should not make the mistakes and look now at the bitcoin community and think like that will be the bitcoin world in 50 years <laughs> i think great, that, that would point. be a, yeah. a, a big mistake uh to make but i think there there is some impact if we choose uh, better money as you um, also brought up Donald Trump, and I think I saw an article from you even covering the transaction uh, that yep. he, he made in the bar uh, yeah. as you also interviewed him. How meaningful uh, is not the transaction alone, but Donald Trump being there might win against Kamala Harris in the administration. There's also Vivek Ramaswamy, RFK, yep. uh, really big guys. Then there's Cynthia Lumis and other people and senators uh, that are really big on Bitcoin. How meaningful is that for Bitcoin that we now have that huge political support? Uh, I think it's I think it's super meaningful. And, you know, from my friends on the left, you know, I get I get flack or whatever. I don't know if we can curse on here, but like you know, I get like I got, you know, people were like, you know, there's some people who are like, why are you speaking to him? And I'm like, it doesn't matter who it was. It was the first it was a it was a former U.S. president making the first public Bitcoin transaction. That's a historical moment. Not only that, but one of the first things that happened in response to that was that all of my contact, like a lot of contacts that I have in Latin America and Africa, people I've interviewed who run circular economies and 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 help onboard people to Bitcoin. I got I got more messages, pro messages from them than anyone else. They were like our president is going to see that and maybe now they're going to be more okay with Bitcoin. And that was, I was not expecting that at all. I was more expecting people to be like, you know, the people that don't like him to be like, why would you even talk to someone like that? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it, the, the effect was the opposite. I think it was really important. I want to give a super shout out, I think to, to RFK who spoke at the Bitcoin conference in 2023 and spoke with great nuance around Bitcoin and the importance of self custody and things that I think a lot of people, like you said, maybe those 500,000 people who really get it, you know, really understand and and he understood that importance and, and on a certain level i'm very glad he's a part of trump's team now because i think it's a very i think he's a pretty measured voice and i'm glad that he'll be in trump's ear especially about this stuff um i think the only thing that's hard traditionally i've been a democrat i'm, I'm sort of a walk away democrat i've lost faith in i think after what the democrats did to bernie sanders in 2016 i'm not going to get too far into that but it just seems super corrupt even what they did to him in 2020 it was just like, okay, they they don't want anything to change. Like there's nothing here. And I think what's interesting about Trump and, um, you know, without, uh, what's interesting about Trump is that for better or worse, we don't really know how things will go. Things I think have more of a potential to change under Trump if he's elected than they do under Harris. The Democrats will sort of 
want things to be status quo, but I, I personally am not happy with status quo. With Trump, things could change now. Could they change in some ways for the worse, like him saying, I'm not going to relinquish power? Sure, they could, without a doubt. Um, could they change in some ways for the better, like him giving power to RFK to say, you know what, I want to make kids healthier. I want to get these toxins out of the food that kids are eating. Like this is what RFK wants to do now. Not only that, but maybe he'll, you know, he'll, he'll be more in favor of setting a tone that's more pro Bitcoin. And because of that, we get better regulation around Bitcoin. And then that regulation, which most of us know is, is going to be copied and pasted and cut up and, and countries around the world are going to adopt similar regulation. Now we've sort of set a tone around the world that like Bitcoin is okay because the United States said so. I'm not saying that that's the way we all should react. It's just the way that things usually do happen. I'm not saying the, even that the United States should have that level of influence. It just historically has been that way, at least in recent history. So I'm, I'm, I'm positive in this regard. I think it's really, really important that, and, and shout out to my boss, David Bailey, for, inter, for actually like educating Trump and saying like there is a difference between Bitcoin and crypto. Um, I had the chance in Nashville to, to interview Trump's son as well, Donald Trump Jr. He came over to the live desk and we got into what Bitcoin is and why you would want it and what the benefits are. And he, he mentioned it, you know, it's, it's an antidote to money printing. It's a, uh, it's something you would use if you live in an authoritarian country. These were not, these were not talking points of any politician or any member of any politician's family in 2020 in the last U S election. This was not a thing. So we're now moving on to a place where some of that rhetoric is now surfacing in the mainstream. And this is, this is what I want. Um, I don't want Bitcoin to remain sort of a counterculture phenomenon. I want Bitcoin to become normalized. And one of the ways to do this is to get bigger people talking about it. So in this regard, I think Trump has done it a service. I think the, the Senator Lummises of the world who have a very nuanced view of what Bitcoin is, thanks to people like Caitlin Long, who's from Wyoming, the, the CEO of Custodia Bank. Um, you know, I think that we're now, and not only that, I spoke with a number of other Republicans, the two senators from Tennessee, Marsha Blackburn, I can't think of the other one's name right now, but they, they came over to the live desk as well. And I was able to speak with them. They're talking about the importance of Bitcoin mining, mining with nuclear energy, the jobs that it'll create. And I'm like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Like now we're actually like, you know, we're, we're, we're having real conversations. I think the only part that's a bit, I guess, shocking to me, like I said, traditionally I've been on the left. Um, I'm now probably, I would just describe myself as a centrist and I'm, I think I'm a registered independent at this point, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's sad to me that what seems to have surfaced is like Republicans are like, okay, we're open-minded to this, might create jobs, there might be some financial opportunity here. Whereas Democrats have remained completely closed off to it. You have Elizabeth Warren and other Democrats defending big banks, agreeing with Jamie Dimon out of all people in congressional hearings. Um, while Bitcoin, in my very humble opinion, is now one of the greatest tools for financial inclusion ever, a term that the Democrats love or that the left loves financial inclusion. OK, well, you now have the best tool for it. Something that another Democrat said, I just covered some of the America Loves Crypto event that the Stand with Crypto Alliance put together. I was in some swing states in the United States, places where that might sway the results of the election. And I, I didn't know I didn't even know this, but um, it was a former congressman who said there's more people in America that now own crypto than own um, uh, stocks. And I, when I thought about it, cause I think only something like 17% of America owns stocks. Whereas now you have, uh, I think 20 something percent owns crypto. I'm, I'm not saying crypto cause I'm a proponent of crypto more broadly. That's just what he said. I'm hoping that that's mostly Bitcoin, but it's, um, you know, it's the conversation is changing. And I think that this is super important. I, I don't think I mean, I think the cypherpunk ethos and building and creating censorship resistant tools is really important. But as we're seeing with the samurai trial, which I've been covering, I've been in the I've been in the courthouse for the last three hearings for the samurai trial. I've, I've met with Kion and William and their lawyers. It's great to create tools, but the power of the state can still come down on you. So we need the state to actually switch its stance on this stuff if we really want to see greater adoption, I think. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep 
the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for a hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love Love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much that's why i think it's so wonderful that we don't know who satoshi nakamoto is yes, that's, totally. that's a huge uh, huge feature of, of of bitcoin it would be um, it might still be um, good or it might still be successful, but it's a huge, huge uh, thing. It's also interesting when yeah. you talk about um, uh, Harris and Trump, it's like, uh, it's it's fascinating when I see politicians that are in the current administration, I see it in Austria right now or in, with Harris in, in America. Uh, and as with El Salvador, I also don't have a lot of clue about what's going on in American politics. Uh, but it's interesting for me when Harry says like, oh, I will do that and do that. And I'm like, she's the vice president, right? She, she, <laughs> yeah. she, 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 yeah. she's, she she's already there, like, uh, and she probably can influence uh, Joe Biden in a major way. So she can she can do things. Uh, same thing in Austria when, when, when the chancellor says like, oh, I will do that when you elect me. And I'm like, you are the chancellor. You That's are it. already <laughs> elected. Like, why not now? One thing that um, I'm wondering about, and a lot of people stated in the comments, and I think a lot of people commented that after Trump's speech is like, why so much crypto? Like, why is he uh, always saying like, I, I think it's great <laughs> that he is really like making the difference and saying like Bitcoin and crypto or not just saying crypto, but like making the difference. Like that's a huge step. Uh, but especially at the Bitcoin conference, it was a little bit like, uh, I think it would have been so much more positively got by all the people when he just like left out crypto of the whole speech. The whole speech yeah. would be way more positive. <laughs> he's so he said something to me that day at Pubkey, and he's on it. He's such he's like half a comedian, half a troll. Sometimes those things are the same things, but I think he honestly does it to just prod people, even his support. Like so, he said to me that day. He was like, I said to him ask them some very basic questions. What do you think? You know, you're in a Bitcoin bar in New York City. What do you think? Oh, this place is great. I love this place. I just paid in Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. And then he, he's sort of like going on. Then he looks at me. He's like, you know, he says something to the effect of like, you know what I call people like you? I call them crypto maniacs. And he does it almost just to like, just to sort of like prod you a little bit, just to be like, let me see what reaction I'm going to get. So I think he almost, it's just his personality. In a way, he's sort of like this, could say it's like sort of like a punk rock personality of like he's just gonna do that thing that sort of ruffles feathers even if he's in a group of his supporters like he's in this bitcoin at this bitcoin conference what did he finish that conference with have fun with your bitcoin and your crypto and whatever else you're playing with like he has to do this like sort of like trollish thing like and i i'm at a point where i'm like i'm indifferent to it i think it's very very good and again like super hat tip 
to my bosses, to, to David Bailey, to Mike Germano for, for educating him about the difference. Um, I have, a, I, you know, and the other side of it is that I'm sure he knows there are a lot of people who are just pro crypto. I'm sure he's heard from them as well. And he's trying to, to reach that audience as well, um, which I guess from a political strategy standpoint, I get it. Um, part of me just thinks like, I don't know, he's like, he's just messing around. I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people felt a bit disappointed after that. But then on the other hand, I think a lot of people, you know, I, for as happy as people are that, you know, Trump is doing what he's doing. I think people are still like, it's Donald Trump. Like, this is sort of the way he is and it is what it is. So, yeah. I think it, uh, a lot of the fact that he was there was a huge factor for me. Yes. Uh, I watched uh, the speech. I watched a one hour delay of the speech. It was hilarious. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, I think alone that he was there and spoke, uh, yep. no matter like people saying, oh, it was just a campaign thing. Like, yeah, of course he wants to uh, win a campaign. So like that's, that, that's normal and that, that's understandable. But that he actually went there. He can, yep. he could went anywhere. Like he has yep. for every evening, 5,000 options where he can go. So that's a huge thing that he spends his time at a Bitcoin conference, yep. um, which is uh, really, really amazing. What, and now I forgot what I wanted to say to that. Could, but, do you mind uh, if I comment on that? I want, yeah, there's please, please. two things that I want people to really understand too. One, it's amazing that he showed up to you know, the Bitcoin event, which had 25,000 people there, but it's even, I think it's even, and I'm super happy that happened, but to show up to PubKey with maybe 45, maybe 40 or 50 people in a bar in New York City, amazing. And I just want everyone to understand this. I know this, I know the people who organize both events. I work for Bitcoin Magazine, so I obviously know them, but I, I go to PubKey every Thursday night for meetups. So I've been going to PubKey for two years, so I know the owners of the bar well. The mo For all of these events, this, at the same time Trump was invited, so was Biden, so was Harris. It, we, we invited both sides. We did not try to make this partisan, neither PubKey nor Bitcoin. Bitcoin Magazine is like a MAGA outlet. That's not the. That's not what this is. We invited both sides, not only with PubKey. They invited Trump. They invited. They invited Harris, Biden. Then they invited our two senators, Chuck Schumer, Kristen Gillibrand. They invited even you know people who were lower than obviously presidents or presidential candidates or vice presidents or whatever. The only people who even responded were, I think, Vivek, they invited Vivek as well. He responded and said he couldn't make it, and then Trump said he could. So. When people say, well, it's just a campaign thing. Yeah, I get that. And like you just said, but that's how representative democracy works. People speak up. They say this is important to us. The politician reacts to that. I don't have a problem with that. You know what I mean? It's like, this is how it works. Like we have made this a campaign issue. It's important to a lot of Americans. It's important to a lot of people globally. It's now an issue. One side is addressing that. The other side is just keeps thinking that they don't have to, like that they're better than it. And, and that's unfortunately Harris' side. She, I think she just thought she could sort of sidestep this or she was just sort of waiting to see, like, do that many people care? They do, you know? And I think people now, whenever you see something about her posted on Twitter, you just see all the comments are like, oh, it's just more empty rhetoric, more empty rhetoric, more empty rhetoric, you know? And that's, that's a tough corner to get out of, especially when you've been vice president under an administration that's been super hostile to Bitcoin and to crypto more broadly. Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a great point. Also, to, to that point where where we talking about the Bitcoin transaction in in the bar, how important in general do we think is it that we spend our Bitcoin that we fire up those uh, uh, circular economies? It's yep. it's like sometimes hard because you have capital gains and and all those hurdles, and it's not accepted uh, everywhere. But how important is that for the adoption right now? I think it's huge and something that most people don't know, but I'm a huge proponent of, and I'll give a shout out to Kirsten Gillibrand, who's the Senator in my state of New York and to Cynthia Lummis. They put forth a bill. I think it was a year or two ago saying that all transactions under $2,000 wouldn't be subject to capital gains tax. This is progress in my opinion. And because I think that even I, I transact with people in the circular economies frequently yesterday, I bought a book at a human rights foundation sponsored event paid paid with it for bitcoin that was thirty dollars sometimes i give a donation that's a hundred dollars all of those things that's just my money me spending it the way that i want to and it's going to people causes circumstances places where i want it to go to i don't want to have to account for that you know i, I don't want to and i don't think it's fair to and I, and even politicians that i've spoken with in the united states have said like it's you know if one side if you're going to abuse the money 
so badly, don't be upset if people start using a different money. If you're going to abuse the dollar and print it to such, and this is politicians saying this. So it's like, I, I, I truly believe that the whole, what people often say, you know, there is no store of value without medium of exchange and vice versa. There's no medium of exchange without store of value. I think it's very much necessary that we start normalizing spending Bitcoin. The problem with that is that it's relatively difficult. Um, I'll shout out to Proton Wallet for, for creating uh, Proton Mail, for creating Proton Wallet. They have 100 million users using Proton Mail. So now making it really easy for people to open up a wallet and to send Bitcoin via email addresses. Super, super cool. That's progress. But I think the bigger issues are like lightning, especially non-custodial lightning is really difficult to use. Um, custodial lightning, I think is good. And I don't, I'm not a purist in that sense. I don't, you know, I think Blink Wallet is a cool wallet and there's a lot of cool things with custodial lightning. I just wouldn't leave a lot of my money in a custodial lightning scenario. Um, but to your point, I think people need to normalize spending Bitcoin. The whole just like hodl forever and this and that. I, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. There's no judgment, but I do think that you know, right now, 94% of the Bitcoin is mined and like 3% of the world actually has any Bitcoin. Those numbers are not going to add up. If you want hyper Bitcoinization, it can't continue to be like that. Having a small group of people basically own all of it, none of it really being used as a medium of exchange. Like we need to change that dynamic. Uh, it's also in interesting with, uh, with Lightning. Um, I personally mostly use uh, Wallet of Satoshi, which mm. is uh, fully uh, custodial so it's it's for me such a small amount where i'm like the most i ever have on there's like 50 euros there you go yeah but if even if i lose it it's like losing your wallet you yes. take your wallet also with you uh, and that's it's the same thing i i don't really care if if that is lost if there would be i don't know uh ten thousand on there or uh, over a thousand or something like that that's an amount where you should actually care about <laughs> yeah. uh, and not leave it on a hot wallet where it's it's uh, it's custodial and if you lose the phone or you leave, if you lose access to your email address or they can just take it away from you. Yep. Uh, but if it's if it's just something that you pay or a restaurant bill with or you pay in a bar like that, that does not matter. <laughs> yeah, agreed. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, um, also to the point, uh, do you see that Lightning kind of already won as a layer two, or do you see other developments uh, in in that regard? Yeah, I think I think Lightning. I'll change the term. I think uh, to to answer it shortly, yes, I think Lightning has very much won. Um, but I think part of the reason for that is because it will end up just being um, not only a layer two in and of itself, but a glue between other layer twos. So it'll be something between liquid side chain and something like botanics, which the spider chain, you know, a, a Bitcoin layer two that's coming out and the other Bitcoin layer twos that exist. So I think lightning is this amazing transactional layer glue. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's proven to work well enough. I'm not, you know, I know it's not perfect. I know it's not super easy, but I also think it's an amazing advancement for Bitcoin and, you know, it'll get better over time. Um, and I think when you see the likes of a company like LightSpark, which has raised literally hundreds of millions of dollars now using Lightning as their payments layer, you know, you can have your feelings on LightSpark and what they stand for, how they operate, whatever. But I mean, you can't, that's if you just look at it from a market standpoint, it's a huge, you know, this is a massive, massive, massive adoption. So it's, you know, I think it's happening. Um, I, one of the things I think a lot about with Lightning, uh, Alex Leishman, the CEO of River, um, said that Lightning right now is sort of a great, it's a great option for transferring Bitcoin between uh, custodial services, custodial Lightning. Like River offers a custodial Lightning version. You have Strike, you have Wallet of Satoshi, you have Blink. And I think that that right now is the best way to use it. It will We will have to make changes to it because once the base chain becomes really, really expensive to use, you know, forget about like opening up channels and blah, 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 even just moving money from the base chain to Lightning. Like you just said, if you're going to have to move, if you only really want to move 50 or $100 or euros worth of Bitcoin at a time, you're not going to want to pay that on-chain transaction to move it from your cold wallet or something like that. So it's a... We're going to have to make it better. There'll have to be advancements. But I think that's one of the beautiful things about this space is that 
to speculate and say like lightning will work or won't work. It's ridiculous because there are so many brilliant minds in this space working on open source software, coming up with solutions that nobody could have ever envisioned five, six years ago. So yeah, I think lightning continues to be the sort of transactional layer for Bitcoin and the glue between all the other layer twos and sort of solutions that come out. Absolutely. I think uh, th that's always uh, my code to answer also like, um, there are so many bright minds in that space, so many great innovators, entrepreneurs. Um, we will figure out how to make a payment rail. <laughs> I'm 100% I'm, I'm uh, yeah. certain that we will figure that out. Uh, and to a certain extent, it already works. Like uh, I already at a, my local Bitcoin meetup last time, I paid with Satoshis, I paid with Lightning. That that It was way easier than paying with a credit card. It's, yes. it's, it's better than Apple Pay already so, yes, uh, yes. In, in certain scenarios but of course there will come uh, challenges along the way uh, also like uh, I, I accept for sponsorships Bitcoin and uh, one company Coin Vigilante uh, they are based in America okay. and we first wanted to figure out how to do the fiat payment and then we're like yeah let's let's do it in Bitcoin we did it on a Sunday uh, afternoon uh, from America to Austria and it was done in minutes right. and I had the confirmation that would have been so complicated in the fiat world. Yes. Uh, so like having one standard base protocol money, it's a game changer. And I feel like not m not many are talking about like that uh, advantage that have one layer, one protocol, one language like English uh, to have as a base layer where everyone all of a sudden can uh, communicate with each other. It's, it's, it's fascinating, you'll see. Yep, agreed, 100%, yeah. Really cool. I have two more fun questions before we come to the end routine. Yeah. Um, what do you think happens when AI uh, is getting to know about Bitcoin and they using uh, different AIs using Bitcoin to ch uh, send Satoshis to each other? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's probably when people talk about hyper Bitcoinization, that's probably when things get really insane in terms of adoption and a system using it. I think my biggest thought with that is that I truly, truly, truly hope that it becomes Bitcoin, that, that it adopts. I think the other day Coinbase was messing around with AI and using like USDC. And I'm like, no, but we need an internet native money for this. We don't need a money that's backed up by the traditional finance system that AI is using. Like, And I think I, whereas I used to think it was sort of inevitable that it will be Bitcoin, I now sort of think we're going to need to push for it to be Bitcoin. So, but when that does happen, yeah, I think that's probably your quickest route to hyper Bitcoinization because if AI is just using it to transact and there's no converting it back to fiat or anything else, it's just becoming part of a system the same way it is in circular economies or whatever else, but with AI on a much bigger scale. That causes now there's more adoption the price of it goes up and we all know like when the price goes up that's what really attracts newbies into the space so yeah i think that that effect will just compound and compound and compound the more ai adopts it uh 100 uh, the, the price is definitely the number one uh, marketing marketing tool still yes. <laughs> it's it's undeniable the data it's so funny because i make thumbnails i make titles uh and i said before i, I collect data from that uh, and people sometimes say like, oh, you're making a lot of videos around the price. And I'm like, no, I don't do it. Like it's, it's like maybe once every two weeks or something like mm -hmm. that. It's like uh, one to 10 percent maybe of my videos. But the thing that happens is all the videos that have a price target, have something with price related or numbers related in the title of thumbnail, they got shoot up in a few ranks. Totally. Uh, and if you look at my latest videos, they're like mixed and then you switch to popular. All of a sudden, all the other videos are price. Is high up. So like it's yep. undeniable the number one uh, uh, marketing tool. Uh, one other fun, uh, sorry, you want to say something about that? No, I agree. I, and I think people who think opposite, one, you're denying data, like you just said, and two, like I, it's not, it was... Um, Herman from Bitcoin Nakasi said, like, of course, the price is important. Like it, the, the thesis doesn't play out because essentially think about it like the way Jeff Booth talks about it, which is that Bitcoin is not going up in price. Everything is falling in price against Bitcoin. So like when you think about it like that, the cost of a house is getting cheaper, takes more dollars to buy one Bitcoin. That's part of the Bitcoin thesis, that it is the perfect denominator, right? That it's the perfect, you know, um, 
it's the perfect unit you would use to economize because it's a stable amount. So it's a set amount. So I think talking about price is super important. And even when it comes to people seeing price, I mean, that's what first attracted me when it came to like, I understood all the tech and I was sort of like, because of my experience was like, oh, I see what this could do. But I was also in student loan debt and didn't want to be in it anymore. So it's like, you know, there's very, I think there's very few of us out there that are just like so financially comfortable that the idea of holding an asset that goes up in price a lot isn't appealing to. So that's fine. I think, I think the magic and based on what you just said, even just in terms of the statistics of how many videos you make about price, I think our work is to sort of, you meet people where they're at and we can call that just the price. And then you get them in with the price and then you start doing the work to explain to them what this thing is and all of that stuff. So I don't think we should ignore price. I don't think it's like a bad thing to touch base on. It just, we don't want to just sort of stop there. We don't want to just tell people about the price and then sort of not explain some of the philosophy or the technology, et cetera. It's a, it's a scoreboard, uh, how fast US dollars and fiat currencies are falling and, and yes. collapsing. I think yes, that, that, that's, that's right. the best way to look at it. Yep. Uh, really cool. One, uh, the second uh, fun question. Um, if Bitcoin would have been discovered 50 years ago uh, and it would have been successful, how different uh, do you think the world would be now? Whew, that's a great question. Um, there's so many factors that make that so difficult. I think so that's a really good question. Um, it's very difficult to predict that obviously, because 50 years ago, like we, we sort of barely had computers, so it's hard to conceptualize that, but let's just say that we did have some way to, uh, let's say transact with gold more easily. So if we started transacting with gold, something that essentially holds value, um, I think the world would be much better off. I think I'm 42. What I've seen in my generation, I was born in 1982, which was 11 years after Nixon took the United States off the gold standard and fiat became sort of a thing globally, is, you know, my parents bought, right before I was born, bought a house for 50,000 US dollars. If I had to guess, that house is probably on the market now. If they were to sell it, like, I mean, we don't live in that house anymore, but I would imagine if someone put that house up for sale, it costs at least $650,000. That is insane. That is insane. You know, because there's no, everything else has not gone up that much. Um, salaries have not gone up that much. You know, all of this stuff has not correlated. I think the biggest thing though, is that, you know what? My gut tells me I'm not super hopeful. <laughs> the world would be much different, but I am hopeful in the sense that I think those who are curious and who were like, why isn't this working? Why isn't, why am I, why is my job not enough for me to buy a house? Why is blah, 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 my salary I think those curious people like you and I who have, you know, delved into Bitcoin would have figured it out. Well, let's just call it like digital gold existed or whatever it was that we could transact with and said, okay, I'm just going to move over to this system now. And I think that that would have been a life raft for the people that wanted to use it and didn't feel like it was a scam, et cetera. Um, <laughs> I think about this a lot like this. I was a teacher for 12 years and you never reach all of the students in the class. You want to, I wanted to, and I always felt sort of guilty when I didn't, but it's just sort of a fact that you just don't reach all of them, but you do reach at least a handful and, and, and those lives will change. I think humanity sort of operates in a similar way. Like when you really think about like, look at Venezuela, if Venezuela, if Venezuela, you know, as things were falling apart, you know, why didn't they adopt Bitcoin more quickly? You know, why didn't they adopt something that would have helped them weather the storm more quickly? I just think sometimes people don't have the knowledge or the motivation or even sort of the emotional effort. They may be in a state of trauma or some sort of shock based on what's going on around them. And they don't have the ability to do that. Um, so on, so to, to answer your question, though, I don't think, I don't think the world would have changed radically for everyone. People may have just accepted the status quo, the dollar, whatever, but I think it would it would have changed a lot for a lot of people, the ones who were curious enough or even the ones who are in enough pain to say, I have to switch to a different system at this point because this isn't working for me. I also think uh, it, it, it would have been um, a, a great thing to, to already have. But yeah, I think the, now we're ready for, for Bitcoin as, the, as you said, like 50 years ago, the infrastructure was not even really there. Yeah. Perfect. Then uh, we have Andrew Dean in the podcast where we have two questions. The first question is the same for every guest. Uh, cool. What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? <laughs> I mean, technically I was a, a language teacher for 12 years. So if you need to learn English, you could learn that from me. <laughs> But um, 
what can you learn from me? Um, I would need some, some English. <laughs> yeah, no, your English is great. Yeah. Um, what can you learn from me? I don't know. I mean, I think I actually, I want to, there's a person that comes to mind when you ask me this question. I mean, my first thought was like, probably harder to be kind and understanding to put yourself into other people's shoes. Um, maybe, you know, before you post that really mean thing online, which I've done, uh, you know, wait 30 seconds and think like, do I really need to do this or something like that? But I would say the person who actually makes me, I think of her all the time when I want to say something mean is a girl, a woman named Rena Chicas. And she's, she's the head of education for me, Premier Bitcoin. And she's just one of the nicest human beings on planet earth. And, you know, it's like, I try to, I tried to think like, what would Reina do? So for me, I'll relay what I've learned from her. And it's just try to like be a bit more kinder, try to accept that we don't need to add fuel to the fire of animosity and antagonism. And this is stuff that I've struggled with and just, you know, take a breath before, uh, before acting sometimes in an irrational manner. And there's a great point. I think that that's not discussed well enough because when you see Bitcoin Twitter, it's very different to being in a real world Bitcoin yes. conference meetup, whatever. People are more prone to having a weird or aggressive or offensive reaction on online, on Twitter, especially yes. on, on Twitter, uh, versus when you actually meet them uh, offline on uh, when you meet them for like a drink or something like that. They're way more calm, way more totally. uh, reasonable. So that's always like... Um, I really always try to push people towards meet people in person, however you want yes. to do that. If you don't have the luxury to be able to go to a Bitcoin conference, uh, maybe find a local meetup, maybe yes. find just like there's orange pill up. There's so many possibilities you can find uh, Bitcoin is in your area. Of course, uh, Bitcoin Amsterdam uh, uh, and all those great uh, Bitcoin conferences all around the world. Uh, are amazing as you have so many Bitcoiners in, in one place yeah. um, and uh, they are they're great to do that. But go find people in the real world Talk that are them. also Bitcoiners. <laughs> I think that's yeah. that's the that's the main thing. Uh, and if you come to Bitcoin Amsterdam, uh, it's uh, it would be a pleasure to to meet all of all of you in the audience. It, it, it's such yes. a it's such an amazing uh, point to to meet people. Yeah. Also, if, on that note, if you haven't bought tickets yet, I don't, I don't know if you have a code, but I'll just show mine quickly. My code is uh, Frank the Tank from old school, if you've ever seen the movie. So uh, if you use Frank the Tank, you can get 10% off your Amsterdam tickets. Um, I think I just got word yesterday I'll be uh, hosting the live desk uh, this year and I'll be doing two panels there. I'll be doing a panel with uh, founders, including... Julian Linegar from Relay. I'm not sure who the representative from Bit Refill will, and then someone from Vexel. And I'll be doing a fireside chat with Maya Parbo, who's running for president of Suriname right now. So yeah, please come out. And please, if you see me walking around and you're there, please introduce yourself. I'd love to, to talk. Absolutely. Yeah. Maya is amazing. I had a podcast with her. I probably will do a second round with her either later this year or next year. Cool. Uh, and Julian is also amazing. Uh, yep. They're amazing people. Really cool. Perfect. Agreed. And yeah, uh, let's come to the end of the where the previous guest is asking a question for the next uh, next guest without knowing who the next guest is. Probably Oof. the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, uh, and the previous guest asked you the question, uh, what is the most unexpected way you have seen Bitcoin impacting someone's life? Oh, I can answer that immediately. Uh, there's, a, there's a gentleman named Luthando Nabambi, and he is the head of community development for Bitcoin Akasi, which is a Bitcoin circular economy in Mazel Bay, South Africa. And I interviewed him for my podcast. I, was, I used to have a podcast called New Renaissance Capital, where I focused on interviewing people from Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia. Um, Luthando talked to me when he spoke with me. He, he never had a bank account. He used to save cash and he, you know, it would constantly lose money or he'd get robbed. People would come in and rob his house. But having Bitcoin as a saving technology changed his life in the way that he's now more hopeful for the future. He, he literally stopped drinking. He doesn't go out to like, you know, a club and waste money. Um, and he talks, he talks about spending more time with his significant other and his child. Um, and he said that this because of the hope that Bitcoin gave him, the fact that he can look into the future and believe that it will get better because of Bitcoin, he has made very deep personal changes in his life. That was actually the moment where I knew that I was on the right path in life and that I was very honored to be doing what I was doing, speaking with people like him. 
Oh, really cool. Uh, that that's a uh, that's amazing, uh, amazing story. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask you questions, and and reach out to you? Yeah, actually, I'll I'll give you my question as well. The uh, for the next guest, um, I I mentioned it earlier how there's a lot of big phrases in Bitcoin: fix the money, fix the world, whatever. I would like. I would like to ask the next guest to add some nuance to one of those phrases. So, for example, does fixing the money really completely fix the world? Um, you know, any any of the main phrases in Bitcoin to sort of say like, okay, there's some truth to that, but maybe add a little bit of nuance to it. So it's a little bit less of a question and more of a request, if that's okay. That's a, I love that. Does fixing the money really fix the world? <laughs> yeah. Or just ask it like that. Yeah. Uh, really cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, where can you find me? Um You can find me a bunch of different places on Twitter at Frank Corva on Noster. You can Google me. I think I'll come up on Primal or one of the apps, just Frank Corva. Uh, if you want to check out old episodes of my podcast, New Renaissance Capital, you can just Google that YouTube, New Renaissance Capital. Um, I write for Bitcoin Magazine, so I have a profile there. I write for Forbes Digital Assets. I have a profile on Forbes site as well. But I think if you Google my name, all of this stuff comes up pretty quickly and you could follow me wherever. But um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to you, Robin. Um, super appreciative of you having me on. Um, and I appreciate also that we sort of got to dive into some topics, you know, on the periphery of Bitcoin as well to talk about things a little bit more broadly. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking with you. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.